He was part of the big 80s duo that had three number one hits and one of the most successful albums in 1985. Then he went solo and he went even bigger. So big that he surpassed the newest releases by Prince and Michael Jackson, Madonna and Whitney Houston. Up next, the story of this blockbuster album that had six top five hits, four of those that went to number one. I count down his best songs in our top five. Coming up next on Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny Iwer. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now, the year 1987 was so rich in great music. I mean, we just talked about it. You um, 2 conquered America with the Joshua Tree. Bon Jovi was soaring with Living on a Prayer. Whitney Houston debuted at number one with her sophomore album, Whitney, the first female ever to do that. And Seemed like as we got deeper into that year, the higher the bar was raised. I mean, Def Leppard released Hysteria. Guns N' Roses dropped Appetite for Destruction. Are you kidding me? In Excess broke through with a kick. Michael Jackson tried to top Thriller with Bad in a way he did with five number one hits. R.E.M. broke through to the mainstream with Document. Ditto Depeche Mode, uh, Music for the Masses. Prince released what is perhaps his masterpiece with Sign of the Times. The Smiths broke up, but they did leave us with strange ways. Here we come to soothe our aching souls. The Cure had its first top 40 hit in America with Just Like Heaven, which should have been a number one hit. And then La Bamba and Dirty Dancing succeeded not only at the box office, but also on the charts. I mean, I could go on and on. But for me, the great pop record of the year 1987 was George Michael's debut solo album, Faith. Like Thriller before it, Faith transcended all genres, all fads, all expectations. It was a perfect record. Faith was not really a studio record at all. It was kind of George Michael's first greatest hits album. Every song is showstopper. Here's the thing though, George was only 23 when he created the music of Faith, 23. I mean, coming off years of mega platinum success as the majority creator of the duo Wham, George was completely primed for solo success, even though Make It Big was number one all over the world, as were many of Wham's singles, including the classic standard Careless Whisper. George was chomping at the bit to step out of the teeny bopper label that was forced on him really by the music press. Um, he would say, and I quote, I was very excited musically to have my own voice, end of quote. He was ready to be an icon on his own terms. This video is a celebration of his two and a half diamond selling pop classic, Faith, by focusing on the music, the songs of George Michael, not so much George the icon, George is the songwriter, the producer, and the singer. But let's get the icon part out of the way first. My own personal experience is probably a lot like yours. In 1987, when I first witnessed the video for Faith on MTV, I mean, the jukebox playing his last hit, the acid wash jeans, the leather BSA jacket, steel-toed boots, the aviator sunglasses, the Holy Cross earring, the five o'clock shadow, with everything in black and white except for the blue jeans, and then that jangle of that acoustic guitar and those first few classic lines. Oh, well, I guess it would be nice. Well, I guess it would be nice. Think about it. All that imagery and sound took about 60 seconds. But in that 60 seconds, George Michael went from fronting Wham! As, and also ran to an automatic icon who went straight away shoulder to shoulder with the king and queen of pop, Michael Jackson and Madonna. And for about 18 months, he dethroned them completely. The video for Faith was perfect, pure cool, in fact, the definition of cool, at least in late 80s terms. I know it's been said before about certain icons, but all the guys wanted to be George Michael and all the girls wanted him. It's true. Um, I got my hands on some aviator sunglasses and a leather jacket. I used one of my dad's tennis rackets and I stood in front of the mirror mimicking his, his every move, his every nuance. Just like millions of teenagers had done with Elvis in the 50s and Beatles in the 60s. George Michael had become our Elvis of the 80s. He had the looks, he had the swagger. He even had something that Elvis didn't. George had the producing and songwriting chops to compete with the greatest of the era. And believe me, that's not just my opinion. 
I've heard it said by some of the greatest ever. George was cool, man. He was he was amazing, man. And he yeah. it was funny because it was interesting because you could tell he was at that point, he was such a uh like a heartthrob. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew he was gay. Mm -hmm. And he was such a heartthrob, but you could tell that he was uncomfortable with that. And uh, he was beginning to try to pare that back a little bit. Like he was trying to change his image a little bit, get a little more serious with his music and all of that. And I remember being in the studio and he was such a, uh, he wasn't, like I say, he wasn't in the studio long, but you could tell he knew what he was doing. He knew his way around. And I don't think he ever got taken quite as seriously as he probably would have liked because he was a good looking guy and the girls yeah. all loved him so great songwriter and yeah he wrote and produced every song on the faith album with the exception of a co-write on hard day and a co-production of a single version of monkey with jimmy jam and terry lewis um, i have the story of that session from jimmy jam himself when they worked on monkey that we'll be releasing on our patreon soon in fact, you can sign up for that below if you want to see that and other great unreleased videos. George Michael was a master producer. He would show that even more in his next few albums, Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1, and uh, Older, one of my favorites. As a songwriter, he was second to none. I mean, six top 10 hits from the album, four of which went to number one. The songs on Faith were multifaceted. Unlike a lot of the pop from the last 30 years, the best pop, they were more substance than style. I mean, these songs cross genres, rockabilly, funk, soul, pop, R&B, even adult contemporary. They tackled social issues from drug addiction and monkey to spousal abuse with Look at Your Hands, even political and hand to mouth. Great song. The songs pushed the album to number one on the album chart for 12 weeks. It was in the top 10 for 51 weeks, almost a year. He also became the first solo white artist to hit number one on the Black Album chart, something he was very proud of. Faith won the Grammy for Album of the Year. It sold over 25 million copies to date, like I said, one of the biggest selling records ever. As a songwriter with the title track Faith, he became the first artist to achieve year-end number one since The Beatles in 68. He was also the first artist since Simon and Garfunkel to have the number one song and the number one album of the year same year as, well, as the only British solo artist to have four number one hits from one album. Um, as a singer, George was just one of the most expressive, passionate, and emotional singers of the era. Even before Faith was released, he went to number one as one half of the duet, I Knew You Were Waiting For Me with Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul. We have the story of that. And you know as well as I do, most young singers would get eaten alive by such an incomparable legend, not George Michael. He went toe to toe, matching the Queen of Soul blow by blow. Did the same thing with Sir Elton John a few years later with the number one duet, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. Think about George, he could sing any genre. So much versatility, I and mean, he was really a killer. Having said that, here's my George Michael Faith Fiver. Yes. Faith is so great as an album, it deserves its own fiber. And I'm even leaving out a number one hit in it. You'll see. By the way, if you like what you've seen so far, subscribe below. We'd love to have you. We do this every day. Number five, I Want Your Sex. The first single that went to number two. Uh, George said that Prince was a big influence on this downright funky song. Killer, soulful, knockout vocal by George. The PMRC, Parental Music Resource Center, led by Tipper Gore, had a field day with this song, as did the BBC, who wouldn't play it. And as usual, they missed the point. The song was pretty mild, really, even socially responsible. I mean, George even writing monogamy on his lover in the video. And as is always the case, the controversy actually helped sell the record. George even thanked Tipper Gore from the stage later on the tour the next year. Um, I remember listening to Faith on my Walkman, on my bus ride to and from school every day. One day, uh, a really straight-laced, like ultra-religious older kid, he started going off on me about this album because of this song and how listening to this particular song would send me straight to hell in a handbasket. He said all of this while wearing a Frankie Say Relax t-shirt. Amazing. Number four, Kissing a Fool. This went to number five. It was another genre-bending classic from Faith with a touch of jazz. 
and a beautiful, heartfelt, crooning vocal from George. There's a reason Michael Bublé covered it. This is such a, a cool, laid-back song, giving early Cole Porter a run for his money. But to you, I loved you. With one of the best ending scats in a pop song that year. And then ending it with George's signature breathy touch. A what a performance. Number three, One More Try. The fourth single and third number one hit from the album. It was known that George had sort of a love-hate relationship with Faith after a while. Um, looking back on it some years before he passed away, he said he wouldn't choose to listen to the songs and that those feelings have more to do with that period of his life because he was massively unhappy and very lonely. He even said that he wore sunglasses for over a year, not to be cool, but because he couldn't make eye contact with strangers. Really sad. He knew that most fans consider the songs of faith to be classics and knew that he would never connect with that many people ever again. But he also said that he considered one more try as probably the best one from the record and the one that he would likely revisit. George wrote it one evening and was said to be just beside himself. He felt that it was a real leap for him and was very excited to show it to his sounding board publisher, Dick Leahy. George's vocal performance on one more try was absolutely transfixing, mesmerizing, enthralling. I could go on and on. It's a gospel-infused, heart-rending ballad of epic agony. Hold you, touch you. At times, George sounds like a wounded animal fighting for dear life, and then at other times, he sounds like a, like a determined reverend preaching the hellfire and damnation of a broken heart. No, that you need me. The song. It's a truly moving sermon. Lyrically, it explores like a young man's sad reluctance to enter into a new relationship because of the deeply emotional toll that he's experienced so many times previously. I know you're wrong. You're not that strong. Let me go. The song concludes with acceptance in a way, a glimmer of hope for the wounded singer willing to try again, ending by singing the title for the only time in the song. Maybe. was a triple crown song, number one in pop, AC, and R&B. Number two, Faith. Faith went to number one for four weeks. It was the biggest song in 1988, although it was number one at the end of 87 as well. Apparently, when George Michael first recorded the song, it was only two minutes. Um, it was devoid of any guitar solos. It was actually going to be the last song on Faith, and George didn't think a lot of it. He showed it to the aforementioned uh, Derek Leahy, after hearing it lay, he wisely told George that he needed to give it a proper single structure, give it a middle eight and resolve it properly. George came back the next day with the version of Faith that we all know and love, and he played it for him and said, and I quote, did you mean like that? I'm sure Derek was like, uh, yeah, like that. Yes, I gotta have George incorporated the classic Bo Diddley beat, along with the long lost art of hand claps and finger clicking along with tambourines and hi-hat. George would never write a song quite like that again. That as George said, went straight for the jugular and uh, did it ever. Not only was it tops in the US, it was number one in Canada, Australia, Belgium, the Netherlands, New Zealand, number two in the UK, Top five about everywhere else, and it still sounds fresh today. Now, before I go to my number one, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. I'm wearing my red ones today with Professor Rock on the side. These are the best glasses I've ever worn. Not just saying that, I really love these. I designed them myself. They shipped them right to me. Go see for yourself at the link below. You're going to love them. Number one, Father Figure. Not only my favorite song from the Faith album, one of my favorite songs ever. I mean, George has said that it started off with a rhythm track with a snare, and that when it was played like that, it sounded a lot like Prince. But he said that he accidentally listened to it without the snare and was just taken aback because it changed the whole sound of the song. He felt that uh, from that one change, that it became a gospel song. Ooh, 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 baby. It was a 
complete accident, George said, and he felt that it resonated even though originally he was going for something else, different sound, but he was able to stop and recognize that accident for what it was that the song was better for it. Now for George, it was these little things that made the difference for him as a songwriter and a producer because he wasn't a trained musician. Like so many others out there who are just brilliant, he said several times in interviews that he was afraid of theory. George once brilliantly said, and I quote, my musical instinct is much smarter than me. So it feels as though, and it sounds so ridiculous, and it's such a cliche, but I sometimes feel like I'm a bit of a vessel. When it's coming from somewhere so subconscious, you're not even aware of energy, the energy of human beings that transforms itself into proper electricity. End of quote. In the verses, father figure is, it's almost sung in a whisper by a deeply moving vocal by George. The exotic music and the, the passionate vocal just warm your soul. I mean layer upon layer of hair-raising, soul-stirring musicality that borders on obsessive, but not ever possessive. I will be your father, George promises his lover the world and more in one of the most breathtaking bridges of the entire decade. And then he sings the outro with, with such an unquenched passion, promising his lover an eternal declaration of love and security. It's so powerful, it's more of a sacred covenant, really. This song has always given me comfort. I mean, there's, there's something about the verses that just calm my fears. Till the end of time. I'm not alone. The song has been sampled uh, rather brilliantly by one of my favorite acts, PM Don. Also LL Cool J and Destiny's Child. With faith, George Michael proved that he could create the perfect pop album. I mean, how could he ever top it? Well, in some aspects he did. Over the next few albums, George wrote from a very personal place. He opened up a little bit on Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1. Then he went full kimono on Older, my personal favorite album by him. And believe me, we will break those down in the future. Love those records. But as far as creating a mainstream pop record for the masses that has stood the test of time, the goal for any all-time artist or goat, as they say, you'll never convince me that another pop album is better. It's like George said in an interview at the time, if you can listen to this album and not like anything on it, then you just don't like pop music. So true. Leave us a comment about George and this perfect album. What are your memories tied to it? Now to get George Michael's albums and his merch, click on our links below. If our content resonates with you, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you be a part of our community. You can also become a patron to help us keep the music alive. Make sure to grab your Zenny glasses. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you for watching.